And now a little change of venue. So as many of you might have heard, the pioneering investigator of developmental cognitive neuroscience, Peter Huttenlocker, passed away a couple of weeks ago. He was 82 years old. He was the person who decided, motivated by his clinical interest in understanding uh, abnormal development, he went in and he started to look at postmortem brains, counting the number of synapses. And it was his work that enlightened us as to the fact that there's a burst of growth of synaptic connections early in development, and that then we lose these synaptic connections, and that this ha occurs in a hierarchical manner with visual cortex pruning first and prefrontal cortex pruning last. I can't even remember an article in developmental cognitive neuroscience that I've read that has not quoted his work. We let his daughter know and she was incredibly touched, and you can see the quote that she gave us. She was very thankful that we were honoring him, and from now and onward, we will always have a Hutton Locker lecture. And this year, we're very fortunate to have a pioneer in his own, in this field as well, Dr. David Lewis, UPMC Endowed Professor in Translational Neuroscience and Chair of Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh, School and Health Sciences. Dr. Lewis, in many ways, similar to what Peter Huttenlocker has done, has done pioneering work looking at the molecular neck mechanisms that are changing through development through adolescence in cortical layers like cortical layer three of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, not only to understand normative development, but to understand risk in particular risk for schizophrenia. So with no further ado, I would like to present this year's Hutton Locker Lecture, Dr. David Lewis, who's going to be speaking about developmental trajectories in cortical circuits, substrates for health and disease. Bea, thank you so much for the invitation to uh, talk at this meeting. I'm very excited that you've organized it, that so many of you, uh, people are here in Pittsburgh, and I want to welcome you to Pittsburgh. Um, and it's a special privilege to be able to give this initial uh, Hutton Locker lecture. And I think it's just the organization of the meeting and this dedication of the lecture to, uh, to Peter's memory, just another reflection of uh, Bea's talent and uh, brilliance, and I've had the privilege of you know, knowing her for a long time, uh, collaborating now on several grants, but I didn't realize just how smart and talented she was until so she came to me to say, you know, I've got this idea for this conference, and she spelled it out to me. I said, wow, that sounds really exciting. So she said, well, you know, will you be willing to kind of give me some advice and help in organizing? I said, sure. And then she came back and said, well, I've got it organized, and I'd really like you to, uh, to be the keynote speaker. Would you be willing to do that? I said, wow, that's a great honor. Sure, I'd be delighted to do that. And then she came back to me and said, well, you know, we got this organized and you're the keynote speaker, but we could use a little money. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in, in approaching me about uh, giving the talk, she said, you know, what I'd really like you to do is to try to help people who study uh, human brain development and to do so at a level of different types of imaging and behavior, help them think about what the underlying neural substrate might be. And uh, so I want to do that in the perspective of recognizing um, the legacy of Peter Huttenlocker. And here I've got the title from a paper that he wrote in 2003 um, that I think captures the essence of what uh, Bea wants me to try to communicate. And that is this idea that there's basic neuroscience research in the case of much of Peter's work at the level of individual synapses and circuits that is critically important for understanding uh, child development. And from my perspective, uh, the seminal paper uh, from Peter that really got me thinking about this is this paper published in 1979, which incidentally was the year that Bea was born, uh, uh, that, uh, <laughs> um, that was really the first identification of the nature and by very dynamic nature of synaptic changes in this case, in layer three of the uh, medial uh, prefrontal cortex, in which he described this curve 
that is plotted here in red. So the red curve is what he published in 1979. Um, he got some flack for the fact that between about the ages of 10 and 20, there weren't any data points. And so he later published this paper uh, confirming that what he said was true, which was the, um, the purple crosses. But the key point of this paper was that there's this multiple uh, dynamic changes in the density of excitatory synapses in this particular location, layer three of the prefrontal cortex. And in particular, what captured uh, the fancy of the field was this marked decline. So there was this overproduction of synapses uh, during the uh, late prenatal and uh, first months postnatally, a plateau period, and then about 40% of those synapses disappear during adolescence. And so Bay has asked me to say, well, can you help us understand how does that kind of pattern of change at the synaptic level enable us to understand these complex patterns of development that you can uh, extract from imaging data, as shown in this uh, recent paper from, from Bea's lab. And Bea, I just want to say that I have no idea. No, no, it's a joke. So what, what I'm going to try to do is to try to connect those two levels of analysis from synaptic development at the level of particular layers in a particular brain region to these emergent properties of patterns of functional connectivity and how they change over development. Now, one of the critical things to show you the influence of Peter's first paper was that three years later, Irv Feinberg used those data in concert with uh, some uh, sleep studies that he's done to formulate the first um, compelling hypothesis about schizophrenia as a neurodevelopmental disorder. So in 1982, he proposed that schizophrenia arises from a disturbance in late developmental events, such as excessive pruning of excitatory synapses on dendritic spines in the prefrontal cortex during adolescence. Five years later, uh, both Danny Weinberger and Robin Murray proposed a different view of schizophrenia as a developmental disorder in which they postulated that there was an event that happened early in life, perhaps during the second trimester of gestation, that created a fixed brain lesion, but the consequences of that were not uh, apparent until normal developmental processes, like the pruning of excitatory synapses in the prefrontal cortex, came online. These were different views of a developmental process, both, though, focused on the importance of the prefrontal cortex in schizophrenia as a developmental disorder. And so what I'd like to do today is to, using schizophrenia as an example, walk you through a set of studies at synaptic and circuitry levels about the development of layer three in the primate prefrontal cortex, and then come back to asking two questions. One, how does that help us understand an abnormal development like schizophrenia? And then the other is, how does this kind of help us understand, uh, have the neural substrate for the emergent properties of the brain that neuroimaging reveals? So to do that, we need to take a journey uh, into the circuitry of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So what's uh, shown on the left here is an image of the lateral view of a postmortem human brain. The dotted line, uh, imagine making a coronal slice there and turning the brain end on. You'd see what's there on the right-hand panel. Um, the gray matter overlying the white matter. We're going to zone in now through the microscope at that area that's shown in purple. And what you see to your left um, are the six layers of the cortex, each layer defined by the relative size and packing density of the neurons that it contains. Below that, the cells in the white matter. And if we zone in, uh, zoom in on layer three at higher magnification, you see the two principal cell types of the cortex the pyramidal cells labeled with P, which exist uh, in about a three to one ratio as excitatory neurons with the inhibitory neurons labeled with G for GABA. And on these pyramidal cells, the dendrites are studded with spines, small protrusions, um, that in the electron micrograph here, you can see the spine heads are labeled um, with S's. They, you can perhaps follow the membranes back to the parent dendrite labeled with D. And at those spine heads, that um, postsynaptic density, which I can get it here, right there, is what Peter Huttenlocker was measuring. That's the synapse that's postsynaptic 
to a presynaptic terminal that's loaded with glutamate where excitatory, most of the excitatory neurotransmission in the cortex occurs. And it's possible to visualize these directly in the postmortem human brain using the venerable Golgi technique. And what's shown in panel A here uh, is an image of a basal or dendrite of a layer three pyramidal cell and its beautiful dendritic spines. And then below that are two examples, extreme examples, of the same cell type, the same dendrites from individuals with schizophrenia. And you can see that there's a marked reduction in the density of these dendritic spines. And you quantify this as uh, Lisa Glantz and Newton, Newton Calori did, find that in individuals with schizophrenia, especially in the deep half of layer three, there's about a 20% decrement in the number of these spines compared to both healthy control subjects and subjects with major depression. And this abnormality in schizophrenia, as shown in the quantitative data, appears to be relatively specific for layer three, especially the deep portion, uh, present in a slight